Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric. I'm, of course, here with Michael. Yes. Mr. Michael Kester, how are you? You know, I'm doing well. How are you? Awesome, man. We're doing a crank and shoot 'em up today. That's right. So, uh, obviously, we have action films here. Yeah. But uh, I think there's something kind of, uh, kind of specific about why we're doing these two films. Mm-hmm. I guess I would call this our apologetic action films. Is that... Would you use the word apologetic there? Is that appropriate? I think, yeah, I guess it works. I suppose I usually uh, hear that in terms of religion or of, uh, you know, a systematic way of kind of proving that something that you firmly believe in is the evident truth. And when we're talking about films, we often discuss them as if our opinions are correct. Uh huh. But as you well know, I love just about fucking everything right and uh and i think we've always had lots of positive things to say about the movies we do but films i mean it's a matter of taste so it's possible that people don't love the films that's true we have on the show so perhaps apologetic is the wrong word but these are definitely two action films uh one of which uh, is is your pride and joy yes and uh one of which is my guilty pleasure <laughs> And I think we have, you know, I even hate to use a term like guilty pleasure because it implies that it's awful, right? but you enjoy it anyways. Yeah, but I wouldn't say that's the case. No, I think both it's of these are... It's just more that you wouldn't go around broadcasting that that's in your top ten, right. like, five, Like if you had three. a... If You're you giving me a, weird looks here. If you had a show that you put on the internet, right. you might not go on it and dedicate an entire episode to it unless you were this fucking show. That's right. Can you tell that our producer has been doing jack shit for right. three years? Yeah. Three years. Three years. Which means the test subjects are running wild here. We're going to spoil both of the movies, mm-hmm. both Crank and Shoot 'em Up. Right. You can use the chapters to, uh, to skip over Crank and go to Shoot 'em Up. Or when you get to Shoot 'em Up, you can skip that. Maybe you'll watch it later, skip to the end of the show. You can pretty much, I mean, we're giving you complete and total freedom yeah. to skip anywhere within the show you could listen to one first you could listen to the end before listening to anything else or you could not download the show entirely that's a feature that's just built right in you don't even have to listen to the us people right who now. have taken advantage of that feature do not know that you just gave them that power it's some sort of catch-22 paradoxical i wasn't prepared to to yeah. bring the heady stuff we're getting today. way too heady already let's get to All the, right. the well par- we've, we've defined apologetics and we've created a paradox i believe it's probably time for crank okay <laughs> Crank is a Jason Statham action film. A A Jason Statham joint. A simple, beautiful Jason Statham. His character's name is, uh, I believe it's Chev Chelios. Right. It's a really memorable name. (laughs) So, I I mean, I'm... I've seen I've seen Crank twice. Uh-huh. The watching it uh, today was for this. You've seen second Crank time. twice. You have not seen Crank two. Right, ever. But I remember right. the name from the trailer because in the trailer he's on the phone or there's voiceover and he says, "My name's Chev Chelios and Durka Durka Dur right. Speed the movie, but in a man's body." And you mean Achy Breaky Heart? The movie. <laughs> you're you're right. Achy Breaky Heart the movie. And I just remember the name when I wa- I was watching it. And his name was Chev Chelios. I was like, oh, yeah, this is the Chev Chelios movie, as if that were a person right, that right. happened in real life, and this sure. were a biopic about said Chev Chelios. Chev Chelios has his own Wikipedia entry. Wow. I'm not sure why. There's a couple the crank name. films. I, it's the name. I guess it is. Is that, like, short for Chevy? Which is short for Chevrolet, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure we're not allowed to say on the air without paying somebody. So we'll get into a little bit why I'm in love with Crank and, and why you really like uh, Shoot 'em Up. Mm-hmm. I think for Crank, it's going to come down to artistic style and yeah. gimmicky camera stuff a lot. But uh, if we are going to talk about gimmicks, it opens with a 16-bit title sequence. Yeah. It was only a handful of episodes ago where we were uh, really just bathing Scott Pilgrim in praise uh-huh. for how amazing it was and the editing and the fast pace. Right. And it, pretty much you could just replay that show for probably right. everything I'll say about Crank. Maybe. Um, I think that Crank has, I think that there's an edge Crank has that <laughs> Scott right. Pilgrim doesn't quite. Yeah, that edge is called digital video. I think yeah. that, that's what's going on there. Um, it's, you know, it's got the 16-bit intro. 
And there's there's a little bit of a, a joke all throughout the thing about video games. Mm-hmm. You know, the video games in the car or the... Um, we just fucking watched it. I can't even remember. Was it this one where... Yeah, it's this one where he tells his girlfriend that he's not a video game designer, which is yeah. interesting. Which is also weird because the directors also did Gamer. Yeah, right. Another movie about video games. They must have some video game hang up. Fuckers. A fetish, perhaps, for video games? An affinity. I wouldn't call it a fetish. I would call it an affinity, but that's because I, too, have a video game affinity. Not a fetish. As covered previously, if you say video game more than four times on our show, everyone stops listening. We have chapters. Yeah, there's two directors, and uh, they're also the writers uh, for this movie, and I think that's probably true on Gamer. I'll be honest, I don't. I haven't seen Gamer. I don't know anything about it. Gamer has a moment. That's really all it takes for me. At that yeah. point, I will now see Gamer. I'm excited to know what that moment I will, might be. I will, I will tell you that it is a musical number featuring Michael C. Hall. I don't believe you. Um, and then they did, you know, Crank 2 right. as well. Crank also starts with a first-person scene, if we're not yeah. talking about gaming-related stuff enough. Yeah, that's true. But it's, it's really cool, and it's really... The room that he wakes up in... Mm-hmm is really difficult to find your bearings because there's tile on a wall. Yeah, right. And at first I'm thinking, okay, he's staring at the ceiling. No, maybe that's the floor. But it turns out that there's a tile wall. It's a fancy looking place. though. Right. It's one of those places that looks fancy, but also like someone doesn't really live there. Right. Like he's home about five minutes a week. Sure. You know, there's not a lot of, it's pretty much a fancy bedroom and then an entertainment center. And a bunch of boxes. It looks kind of like a mix between a penthouse and a warehouse. Yeah. And so we get this opening that's a little warped. Uh, He's getting up on the bed and it's giving us that sort of wavy filter over there. Right. Setting us up for the... I mean, I think the first time I saw Crank, I was completely overwhelmed. I hated it in the first 30 seconds. Yeah. Too many gimmicks, too many cuts, too many different camera angles. We're doing black and white. We're going to a TV it just it bugged it bugged the shit out of me it really did and i think it was probably the point where the metal kicked in where i thought all right i just have to surrender to this premise right you know it's as if no one told me just because of the editing and the the style in which it was filmed it's like a movie with a supernatural twist that i wasn't aware of before i i kind of raised my hand and said hey i didn't sign up for this and then just decided to embrace it instead I don't really know what you would call this form of... Is this thrash? What kind of metal is this? I, thrash sounds okay. It's I mean, uh, it's kind I, of a fast tempo. It's I dirty. I don't know the genres within metal. Sure, right. The way that I wish I did. In Shoot 'em Up, when they call it death metal, you're not right. really sure if, that's, if yeah. that's true. Uh I know that the thing that happens on the phone is called the Doppler effect, right? Okay. The sound the phone makes is if you were driving by the phone where the, the sound kind of shifts. Yeah. It's like a, an ambulance yeah. driving yeah. by the Doppler yes. effect. right. I do know the, uh, and I think I've mentioned this to you on the show before, I know a lot more about the music in Crank 2 High Voltage, Uh which is all Mike Patton from Faith No More Mm -hmm. and uh, The Voice of the Darkness and uh, a lot of great stuff there. Before I talk about the look of this too much, though, there's, there's one scene that's kind of normal art before we get into weird experimental crazy art, and that is the, uh, I think I'll call it the medicinal use coke scene. So after we get out of, you know, he leaves his, um, I'd see, I'm hesitant if, do I call it a penthouse, a uh, apartment building? Yeah. What did call it living quarters? He leaves his living room right after he's bashed his TV in very uh-huh. angry and he's driven off and he's, he's gone to see these guys and, um, he's trying to hunt somebody down. And so he's starting to, he's got the one guy cornered in what, what I guess is a bathroom, right? Yeah. And all of the walls are painted black. It's an all black room with eventually a bunch of black guys in black clothes. Right. And uh, the only white in the room, it's a a really interesting style uh, for a movie that looks as cheap as this does. It's just white smoke. And the dude who's smoking just looks super fucking cool. Totally boss. He's got a a cigarette holder. It it almost looks like a mini version of uh, the the kind of infamous Corella DeVille cigarette holder. Right. And I guess the only other white in that scene would be Jason Statham, as uh-huh. they point out. <laughs> and eventually the coke that he has to snort right. in order to maintain the, the right, maintain the adrenaline. And that's the, I mean, that's as close to, you know, Kubrick as this movie yeah. is going to, going to go. Everything else that interests me visually or artistically or uh, as far as composition about it is, 
I don't want to say abrasive. I do yeah. want to say abrasive. It's it like, is. It's like repeatedly being punched in the face. Yeah. You're just getting socked in the face over and over by a camera, really. Yeah. Uh, or by Jason Statham. The look is, it's bizarre. At first, I thought it was over sharpened, mm-hmm. right? It kind of looks, you know, if you've ever played around in Photoshop or in, in uh, Aperture film editing even, and you go to sharpen your image, there's a level that you can sharpen it to bring, to basically fool your eye into thinking it has a little more detail, uh, a little more stark. It, it has more sharpness right. to it. And then eventually it just starts to look really fucking weird. Yeah. Almost as if you have a goofy filter over it. Yeah. And that's kind of what this movie looks like, as if it's over sharpened. Yep. But I was reading about these directors and they shoot exclusively on videotapes. Wow. So this was all shot in HD video. I actually have a, a list of the cameras they use for high voltage. I, I couldn't find one for this movie. But it's, I mean, it's almost consumer grade, the type of bullshit cameras that you would find probably at a fucking Best Buy or whatever wow. at the time that they shot this movie on, which adds to, I mean, that cheapened, gritty, fucking punk rock look to it, but also to the fact they're shooting on basically no budget. Right. I believe, uh, let's compile a list on air right here. What did they pay for in this movie? Uh, they wrecked a car. Okay, so. Yeah. Seven, $7,000. Seven Is maybe that the figure seven, for five. Okay. Um, there were a number of bullets okay. fired from guns, blanks. I'm, yeah, I would have I, normally I would have said computers, but apparently nothing computer generated in right. here. Although I'm really curious about that fall from the yeah. helicopter. Yeah, and then that uh, used Google Maps though, right? Right. <laughs> that's probably. Yeah. I think he literally fell into Google Maps. That's possible. If not there, everywhere else yeah. in the film. And then, I love how frank that is, too, by the way. It's just, it, yeah, we'll use Google, whatever. It's cheap. Yeah. People think it's funny. Yep. It has to have the Google logo in the corner, apparently, if you steal it off of Google. Awesome. Sorry, so that. And then what else? Jason Statham. And some rollerblades, too. Oh, we'll get to that. So a lot of people think back to Crank, uh, and they think about fast edits. You know, like I was talking about with Scott Pilgrim. Mm-hmm. That's a movie that genuinely has fast edits. The scenes do not linger very long. Not not even the scenes, but the shots moving from one place to another, regardless of how long a scene itself is going to take. I think the the physical amount of time you stay in a static camera shot on uh, within the movie Crank is not actually that different from a normal film. Yeah, I think you have a lot of shots that are you know several seconds long, and it's. Uh, it, the visual style just seems as if it's frenetic, as if it's rigidly right. paced and belligerent, you know, yeah. frantic, really. Right. And a lot of that is probably the, you know, high shutter speeds on, on some of these action uh, scenes. The camera is physically capturing motion a little bit faster than maybe you normally would. Mm-hmm. Part of that is the dirty video. Mm-hmm. But a lot of that, I think, is the movement of the camera. Yeah. You know, nothing is on a tripod here. Right. We're not really using dollies for any yeah, of this Yeah, it's all stuff. jittery and shaky and right. fun, good time, Chase and Jason Statham. Chase and Jason would have, was the uh, working title. That's probably the name of their camera rigs. This yeah. is the Jason Chaser 1, and this is the Chase and Jason... I'm, I don't believe that I didn't stutter through those. I didn't even... I wasn't planning on finishing that sentence. <laughs> I figured I would just trip through it. It's okay. So maybe there's some study cam stuff, right? Because I'm not 100% sure what they used on this. Uh, some kind of camera harness where it's physically fastened to the operator. Uh, or maybe something handheld. But there's a lot of really unorthodox movements to the camera. Mm. It, the camera itself is the fastest element of this movie. The way it's not cutting, but actually moving right. within the scenes. You have these documentary style zooms as well. Um, that sort of add to some of that rigidness. But uh, the actual movement of the cameras, again, I was reading about the directors, who, by the way, operate their own cameras, Uh which is kind of awesome. Right. So it's not them and a team of cameramen, and they're sitting behind monitors, you know, in a a fucking recliner while people run around on the street. In a chair and a hat with a bullhorn. Yeah. This is basically a sound guy and two directors who are holding cameras and Jason Statham running around behaving like idiots. And Dwight Yoakam. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, St- sitting right. in one of two locations, either being massaged or uh, being on a payphone. For the uninitiated, your yeah. co-host, who the fuck is that? Dwight Yoakam is actually, he's a really, really, really famous country singer. Country, you were talking me about 80s. this. Yeah. He, uh, when? He started in the 80s. I okay. mean, he's still, I think he's still putting out records, sure. but his big his big days were in the, in the late 80s. He put out Hillbilly Deluxe, which uh, 
was the title was later parodied for a record named Hellbilly Deluxe that came out in the in the 2000s era. Interesting. I can't remember who wrote that, yeah, but you should definitely check that album yeah, out. Yeah, and we can't tag it. So. Also, Hellbilly Deluxe 2. That's a really fucking good album, best by the one. way. Best one. That's a heavy claim you just laid down there. The best one. So in this article I mentioned, the uh, one of the ways they accomplish some of these unorthodox movements, and I know this is something they've carried over in, in some of their other films. I'm not sure if they were still using it all the way back on the original Crank, but they'll use rollerblades. Huh. Simply people on rollerblades. And you don't think about it, but it's a lot faster and it's right. a lot more steady than running around like a fucking idiot. You don't, uh, you know, you can sort of even out a lot of your footage. If you were to use something like uh, motion, uh, part of all that Final Cut stuff, you can, uh, or even a lot of basic software that comes on computers now, you could take a really shaky piece of footage and by cropping into it a bit, you can get the computer to smooth it out, make it look a, a little bit more professional, like you weren't just running around like a fool. Right. But instead, you can blade around like a fool. So these guys that will literally use rollerblades, and I don't know if they're mounting cameras on rollerblades. Or yeah, that seems the, like a really dangerous... <laughs> doesn't it? That seems to have doubled, possibly, the uh, cost for the film. Because... Well, when you think about the cameras are shooting on $5 tapes, That's and true. they're probably $400 cameras... Then it might so not be that, that big of a deal. So does that mean that they're shooting at 30 FPS then? Oh, look at you, fancy man. Depending on how crappy these cameras are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, when you have a standard, you know, 24 frames a second for right. a movie, that's uh, that's a standard now. But I, I yeah, probably. Yeah. Good old, that, like, 2997. It would explain on the, a lot yeah. of the jittering and a lot of <laughs> why Jason Statham doesn't look like he's in a movie. It would explain your your theory of Jason Statham's my neighbor. Let's make a movie called Chase and Jason. That does seem like what it is, though. Yeah, isn't it? And that's no, part it definitely of the, does. The charm and the the simplistic beauty of this movie is it sort of seems like you just rented Jason Statham for a right. weekend, which is really what you do with any actor. Is sure, you rent sure. them. Not too far from Drew. They get a check. They show up for a certain number of days, or you know, vice versa. Maybe they. I don't know if they show up first, and I actually have no idea uh, about filmmaking and hiring people. But there's some sort of compensation. You get them for a couple of days, and you shoot the fucking thing. They jump thing. off a building. And this just looks so... I mean, it reminds me of Jackass. It mm -hmm. reminds me of you have a small crew of people. You go out. You just shoot this bullshit. And it, this one just happened to have a script. And uh, you go out, and you accomplish this number of scenes. And it's just over the top and ridiculous. And by keeping these movies incredibly cheap, you know, it's like talking about the Rodriguez method, uh, talking about a lot of these filmmakers who can make all these different projects. No one really questions them on it because it costs them 10 or 15 grand to make. They can get away with doing pretty much whatever they want because they're going to see a, a fiscal return. I mean, Jason Statham could make YouTube videos and people would, I, they would probably box office more than $15,000. Right. You know what I mean? Right. It's just, uh, especially in this era, you know, people will turn up to see this. And if you can make that cheap look sure. part of your aesthetic, sure. that's the, the beauty of something like paranormal activity, right? Yeah. That's exactly what they did. They took that to an extreme. They said, uh, it's hey, supposed to look like this. Yeah, right. That's, that's it's what you do. It's supposed to look like this yeah. can save you $10 yeah. million. Dollars. The phrase, it's supposed to be that way. Right. I was, I'm, I have a, I'm friends with a guy that owns a cafe um, near my apartment. Sure. And I was helping him clean up some stuff at the end of the day the other day. And I was like, you should really kind of scrape all the tape off your front windows. He's like, if I scrape the tape off, then they're going to expect everything to look a lot cleaner. <laughs> sure. So if I leave the tape, then they'll realize that it's kind of supposed to look a little bit messy it's the same idea it works it works outside of film everybody everybody take the it's supposed to look that way theory to any any and everything they possibly can so there you have it that's your aesthetic and you know part of what draws me to that is it's creative filmmaking uh it's an excuse and it's silly and you know we appreciate it for that but also using methods that are outside the box, it defies convention. It makes something that looks interesting and new mm -hmm. and not like every piece of shit that's churned out by film school directors. Someone's going to send us an email saying these guys went to film school and I'm going to look like an asshole. But you know what I mean? Yeah. So beyond the method that these cameras actually get around, there's, uh, there's also really extreme angles. Yeah. You see that a lot. Even and, in the cars. Right. Like while right. they're driving, you get shots from behind the gas pedal. You know, it almost reminds me of surveillance footage. Mm -hmm. I know it wasn't too long ago we were talking about look again, but uh, those kind of angles where things are in far corners. 
Um, they're shooting up from the floor. They're behind the canister of Red Bulls in the 7-Eleven. Yeah. You put cameras where you wouldn't expect it, and the audience is very aware of that, and it's gimmicky and kind of kitschy, but it works for what you're doing. And having those interesting places keeps people's interest peaked through the movie rather than spending that on another expensive explosion, rather than buying something to put in your frame, you are physically, I mean, you're earning your money d- yeah. that day. You're showing up and you're saying, let's put the camera over here. People don't put cameras over here. Wonder why not? Let's put it over there and see how much it aggravates <laughs> our audience. Why is the Red Bull in focus and not Jason Statham's beautiful bald head? Now, there's something else that's going on while these cameras are rolling uh, called plot. Oh, okay. And uh, you may have noticed that uh, in your film, Shoot 'em Up. Yeah, as there's, well. There's, uh, there's, uh, yes. Can you tell? I'm actually excited to talk about Shoot 'em Up. I keep trying yeah. to jump into it uh-huh. prematurely. Um, there's some exposition going on in Crank, and yeah. we should talk about the methods of exposition in each sure. of these films. The method that Crank presents is uh, crashing a car through the mall uh-huh. in probably the most relentless carnage since the. You know, the Terminator 3, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Crane scene. And just having the exposition go on over the phone while driving the car through the mall. It's one of those scenes where you know that no one's listening to what's on the phone. The audience is, you're aware that the audience is hearing it. The audience is kind of taking it in. And then later, if someone thinks to themselves, wait, this doesn't make any sense. Why is he doing this? You almost shame yourself as an audience member. Yeah. You go, oh, they explained that during that car. I really wasn't paying attention yeah. during that. He was crashing. The car was on an escalator. Yeah. I heard nothing that doctor said. And I love the idea that an audience might question you or call you out as a filmmaker. So you just make them feel shame instead right. for not paying attention sure. to you earlier. The other method of exposition that I noticed in Crank is explaining things to his girlfriend. Sure. Which certainly. is a which is a really nice technique because amidst explaining things, he also fucks his girlfriend, which then goes on to further promote your shaming the audience theory in that right. they just go, Oh, that must have been something he said while he was inside her. Right. Oh, I, I was wasn't... looking I was looking at her boob, which may or may not be stunt doubled. I really should have been paying attention to that. So it goes without saying that, I mean, the, the movie's really fucking enjoyable. That's sure. why I like it. Absolutely. It's, uh, I find it does get better upon repeat yeah. viewings for whatever reason. Um, I think I, it's because you're less upset by it. Yeah. It's one of those things <laughs> yeah, that right. you watch once and go, that movie is a headache. Yeah. And then you watch it the second time and you think, no, it's not as bad as I thought it was because right. you're expecting. Right. I was ex- honestly, I was expecting like Jason Statham and strobe lights. Right. But that's, that's, that's how I always remember the movie, yeah. is Jason Statham and Strobe Lights. Uh, or Jason Statham and his gay friend, Comic Relief, which is fucking awesome. Best use of, uh, of that Comic Relief character. And so, I mean, usually the Comic Relief character is so overused. Yeah. And here, he's got a bag over his head before you know it. Yeah. That shocks me every time I see the movie. I'm thinking, he's dead already? We're not yeah. even at the end yet. Right. Where's the scene where they, you know, comically hug at the very end resolution. Says, Don't get any ideas. Yeah, right, right. Instead, he falls out of a fucking helicopter. Chev falls out of a helicopter, makes a mildly humorous call to mm-hmm. his girlfriend, which uh, basically wraps up the script on your film, and then he falls to his death, nails a car, flips through the air, and lands uh, about three inches into the, uh, the focal point of the camera. Yeah. And it looks bloody and injured as fuck and blinks. And the movie just ends. It's an awesome way to end your it movie. It really is. It's, uh, what's even more awesome is then Crank 2 comes out. And the only thing I can think, and it's the stupidest thing to think, but I have to watch it because I want to know, well, he clearly died when he fell out of a helicopter, landed on a car, and then splatted on the pavement. How are they going to bring him back from that? Fucking awesome. I love it. Uh, Shoot 'em Up is another movie. That yeah, happened well, today. I mean, if you want to, if you want to talk excitement, shoot 'em up starts just as exciting as Crank ends. It starts at a bus stop. You know what's funny about that though? For as many times as I've seen shoot 'em up, and I get to get a little credit back now because we were just talking about um, Hatchet, Cabin sure, Fever, a while ago, yeah, a couple and shows uh, how I haven't you know seen those movies in right. forever, and I felt awful about it. I've seen shoot 'em up about a thousand times. Yeah, me too. And uh, it's not even, you know, list of top favorites or anything. I think it's just because anytime I'm around you, you're watching Shoot 'em Up. Yeah, That's probably why I've seen it. A lot. As many times as I've seen it, I would think two thirds have probably been with you. The thing that I like about starting at the bus stop at like, it looks like it must be fucking 1 a.m. Right. 
you have this guy who's sitting at the bus stop. He's clearly had a long day or mm-hmm. a long series of days. Sure, you don't sure. know anything about this guy's former story. He sits at the fucking bus stop and stuff starts to happen. And I don't know how often you sit at a bus stop in Chicago at one in the morning. I don't take the bus. I okay. hate the bus. Well, I, I sit at bus stops a lot and sometimes it's at one in the morning. And without fail, something obnoxious happens. Oh, yeah. Sure. You're just sitting there and someone's just and I just like the idea that this guy's just sitting at the bus stop. He wants to go home. But instead, he has to save this pregnant lady. Has to deal with this bullshit. Right. We uh, we record outside of the infamous Wilson stop. Yeah, on the, the worst Redline. CTA stop <laughs> in the city of Chicago. I would say literally, I mean, if you're talking about the northern east side, which yeah. is the livable part of uh-huh. the city, uh, the part where you, you don't really need to worry about getting mugged or right. like, stabbed or shot. It is far and away the the worst stop until you really get out of the city. It was voted the worst stop in Chicago. I mean, it's awful. It's the stop where when you get off of the train, we're talking about now, the uh, the L, the fucking platform train, you come down and you get off the steps and right outside the, what are those turnstiles? Is yeah. that what those are called? Yeah. Basically right outside the spot where you need money in uh-huh. order to access, you find a bunch of people who don't look homeless, but have chosen to be outside Sitting around some steps of, uh, it's in the summer, it's a boombox. Yeah. And uh, in the winter, it's usually a barrel fire. Yeah. I mean, it's almost comic book esque. Yeah. I don't even think you see this sort of thing in film. It's so fucking ridiculous. Anyways, that bench scene, always remember that. From yeah. Shoot him up. It's one of those things that seems like it would be great on paper, too. Sure. We open, you know, from a black screen and our, our hero is sitting on the, mm-hmm. the bench and. A pregnant woman runs by, right. and a man runs by with a gun, and he finishes his carrot and says, "Oh fucking heads in!" I yep. mean, it's it's perfect. And he walks into this. He walks into this warehouse, beats the shit out of a guy, takes a gun, and then Nirvana starts playing. <laughs> right, starts playing "Breed" by Nirvana, which is far and away my favorite Nirvana song. Excellent. And he just starts going fucking crazy. And this is when you realize what kind of movie you're watching, because if this were a typical gunslinging commando-esque have you seen the the schwarzenegger movie i'm aware of what you're talking about where he just has a gun and he just shoots a lot of people right but he's just shooting them instead you get tactful kind of martial art-esque shooting where instead of shooting bad guys he's shooting the environment to help him be able to get really close up shots of everybody. Yeah. It's uh it's choreography. Sure. I mean, it's, a, it's a dance. It's a ballet. Yeah, he, right. uh, he shoots out an oil barrel, slides under a table, shoots the legs out from a table, flips through a window, kills a bunch of guys, runs through a door, points his gun at the camera, and that's when you get the title. Shoot him up. There's our intro. Yeah. It's uh it's the stunning triumphant intro card we talked about in Martyrs. Yeah. Although I believe Martyrs cheated. It had a double intro card, yeah, right? it did. Fucking cheaters. <laughs> so there's two names that really right. need to uh, to be mentioned here. Mm-hmm. One is Animatronic Baby, and the other is CGI Baby. Or actually, uh, I was going to go with Clive Owen and Paul Giamatti. Which one of them plays the baby? Paul Giamatti's the closest. So uh, these two guys, uh, they had some huge careers right around when this movie yeah, came Yeah, they out. really did. Not to say they're not stars now, and not to say... Uh, I mean, that almost sounds offensive to say, hey, that was really the year of Paul Giamatti right. and Clive Owen. But goddamn, was it? It really was. That was when Clive Owen, that was right around when Clive Owen was in Children of Men. Mm-hmm. Paul Giamatti was still reeling from his newfound sideways fame. Mm-hmm. And they kind of, it, they both play roles that at the time, people didn't expect them in. Clive Owen had just gotten an Oscar nomination for Closer. Sure. And Paul Giamatti was just this down and out bum character. That, right. But All instead, the time. in this, they're just total badasses with huge guns and nonstop floods of one-liners. Well, it's the sort of movie, not to keep going back to things on paper, but when you tell your friend there's a movie, one guy shooting at the other guy, it's the action film this summer, the hero, Clive Owen, the villain, Paul Giamatti. It's called Shoot 'Em Up. You don't even need a trailer for no, that. No, you really don't. What trailer do you need for this movie? You need. You just need, you need a, one of those cardboard giant displays in a theater (laughs) and it just has clive owen pointing a gun at paul giamatti and says shoot him up and that's all you need right and that's exactly what they did yeah well that and uh 
I know we love advertising on the show and we talk about, you know, the grindhouse stuff mm-hmm. and these great old trailers or deceptive marketing. Once in a while, uh, viral marketing comes out. The reason I really love to cover that is because viral marketing also has a tendency to disappear fairly quickly. Yeah. People forget about these viral campaigns. And these days, especially, everything has a viral component to it. Some of them are lazy. Some of them have gotten really good. And unfortunately, part of sort of playing a game for a movie is the the unknown factor for that. The Dark Knight viral campaign was uh, was just about the mainstream point for when everybody started finding out about these. But a bit before that, there was a viral campaign for Shoot 'em Up. And it wasn't interactive. It wasn't so much a game, but it was called Bulletproof Baby. And <laughs> you've seen this video. Yeah. Um, so essentially, it was a website that sold. It was basically trying to be controversial uh-huh. and get some press attention. Sure. It's trying to upset people. Yeah. Kind of like the, I don't know if you've ever seen Bonsai Kitties. Oh, yeah. I think that's how that's pronounced. Yeah. As we all know, my pronunciation is awful. Yeah. But um, cats it, in a jar. Yeah. People would put these cats in a jar and raise them that way so that when they took the cats out of the jars, they would be jar-shaped. And it was uh, kind of this niche pet thing, and people would own... The, no one had, This didn't exist. I mean, it was just an internet site that purported it. People got outraged, and they went to it. And, you know, this, this is the internet meme, right? This is viral marketing. Mm-hmm. And so shoot 'em up capitalized on the same kind of idea by having Bulletproof Baby. And so it was just a website that sold this stuff. You probably couldn't even buy anything off it. But it was just strollers and cribs and vests and uh, kind of based off... (laughs) Tasers. It's based off the idea of the movie, but specifically probably that bulletproof vest that they buy the baby. There's a video that's still floating around. You can find that okay. Uh, It's harder to find stuff from the website. But it's the video of a woman shooting a machine gun as kind of a product demonstration at a bulletproof stroller. It's definitely worth checking out. Kind of sad. This is, there's a great idea in this. Yeah. Somebody needs to come up with, not in Bulletproof Baby, right. but in collecting these viral ads. There needs to be a website that just completely archives this stuff so you can come back yeah, to it later. For sure. And I think that the Bulletproof Baby thing really kind of points to the idea of the film, which is, I, I'm just going to I'm gonna write it off as fun with guns. Sure. Because that's really what the film does is every encounter that Smith has with Henchman or Paul Giamatti or Hammerson, played by our good friend Stephen McHattie from sure. uh, Pontypool. It's not the same thing as a typical Mexican standoff shootout. It's right. not, I'm a super soldier. It's him being tricky, him using the gun in a different way. It's him fucking a girl and shooting people. It's him setting up a Home Alone-style set of mazes and traps where right. he can operate them all s- from strings in the yeah, back of a room. there's something very Rube Goldberg about a lot of this stuff. Sure. Especially opening the door with the rat. Yeah, that I, mean, I think the is the definition one. of Rube Goldberg. It's interesting that you brought up Home Alone for that stuff because the scene you mentioned uh, before it, the scene where he's having sex with uh, yeah. Monica Bellucci's character, isn't that just the scene from Desperado? Desperado, yeah. We're just doing an amped up version of the well, scene from the Desperado. Thing, the difference is he stays inside of her. This is getting far too close to insulting Antonio Banderas sexually, which is not something I'm comfortable doing on Double Feature. Yeah, I'm right with you. So fucking mixed with action is just part of the sure. kind of the cheeky humor yeah. of the movie. Well, the whole movie has this overtone of it's it's ridiculous. The whole movie's ridiculous. It knows it. Its lead character's got a, essentially a superpower that comes from consuming carrots. Right, right. He has this love he for carrots. He is a carrots. cartoon character. Yeah. And he it's not only the characters that are cartoonish it's an, it's this weird political plot <laughs> sure. that kind of uh, is also cartoonish yeah it it unravels during the course of the movie where it turns out they're making babies for bone marrow for a double crossed plan to is save it bone the bone marrow senator. or cord blood oh no you're right it it's is bone, bone marrow. marrow yeah right and the gun companies are trying to kill this senator, but then the senator sure. makes a deal with them. It's all <laughs> this really deep, evil political plot. And there's no way to expose that kind of a plot in a film like Shoot 'em Up or even in a film like Crank. Right. If Crank had the kind of underlying plot that Shoot 'em Up tries really hard to have, it would have the same problem that Shoot 'em Up has, which is someone's on a phone explaining the film. Right. 
or Clive Owen or Paul Giamatti suddenly come to a conclusion that moves the film along. Well, you don't race through your locations as fast right. in, uh, in Shoot 'em Up. Shoot 'em Up takes a lot of time to linger in the scenes to really enjoy them, make them memorable. Right. Um, you have that, uh, that brothel specifically right. uh, where they spend a lot of time and kind of go back to. Um, they have the, you know, the scene where they first go into that. Talk about a movie really of that year. You remember Bittersweet? Yes. The band Bittersweet? I, they had a, a bunch of stuff that was used in spy thrillers. And I feel comfortable talking about them on the show because they're almost more score than they mm-hmm. are, you know, in the realm of the music industry. Right. I feel like that comfortably falls under cinema. But, you know, you see that uh, even in the marketing to what was that other Clive? Remember, there were those two Clive Owen kind of spy meets a woman movies that came yeah. out? Yeah. What were those called? The International. Uh huh. And didn't want to have Julia Roberts. Oh no, yeah, um, duplicity. Remember. That was it. Yeah. But bittersweet was used in that. The song in here is "Dirty Laundry." It's really loungy. It's a. Uh, it's very cool stuff. Kind of uh, trip hoppy stuff. So you get in that brothel. It's a bunch of different fetishes in every single room. Yeah. A bunch of different colored gels lighting the room. The tacky wallpaper and all of the the red and the purple stuff and the blue stuff and the baby bottles, the fluorescent overheads that are on the fritz. Yeah. After uh, the shootout, just flickering. That's the scene where he offers her... This is a a high point of debate between you and I. He offers her $5,000 to take care of the baby. And, uh, I mean, is this an adequate amount of money for this? Well, I mean... He says that this will keep her off her back for several weeks. For for two weeks. Okay, implying that she would not have to work for two weeks. Implying that she would make about $5,000 in two weeks. Okay, so this is where I think the point of contention lies. I believe he's treating her job as if something she does not enjoy doing, which is uh, not the case for most people who work in brothels. But sure. I, this is a dingy looking brothel in a city. It's probably very uh, underboard. So It's who knows? comic booky. Yeah, so I get the feeling that he's saying... I know you don't want to do this. You could survive for a couple of weeks off of this $5,000. Yeah, that makes sense. Because if she only made $5,000 in two weeks, she's making what? A couple hundred dollars a day? $357 a day. I mean, even uh, by by streetwalker salary, that's uh, low. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, what is the Vegas standard if you're, it's like $2,000 right. uh, for intercourse or half and half or something to that effect? I've only been in Vegas once, and I didn't never... drop two grand on a hooker. I didn't. Got to go back. Probably only because it cost two grand, uh-huh. and I think that's out of me being cheap rather than my love of the industry. But she does make enough money giving head behind a dumpster to buy a bulletproof vest. Approximately three hundred dollars. See, this is what I'm talking about. If the bulletproof baby website was still in existence, we would know the exact dollar amount yeah. a bulletproof baby vest cost, and mm. then we could uh, we could do our bookkeeping on this a little bit better. Social failure. So I got two more things before we wrap up here. Sure. One is I want to discuss the one thing that I think this film shouldn't get away with. And it is animatronic baby getting run over by a car. (laughs) Sure, why not? Now, what I don't like about that is I don't see how he put together an animatronic crying baby doll. I wish they had shown him picking up a screwdriver and a spring and some gears maybe throughout the course of the movie planning to do this i was gonna call you out i'm not really hoping that you saw that but that kind of sounds interesting all right yeah. i'll take that and then you go oh that's what he was doing it for. Sure, sure. but i also would really like double feature show at gmail.com if somebody could make me a <laughs> gif image of paul giamatti running over that baby and then giving it that successful haha look as Beautiful. as he crushes it with the tires if you want to send a gif image of that to double feature show at gmail.com i would be forever grateful my inner nerdery forces me to point out that I believe it is Jif. Oh, I'm sorry. Beyond that, that would be amazing. Yeah, That would please. be fucking amazing. That would be better than the Whoopi Goldberg animated Jif that Rebecca Watson gave us. I don't remember what she was doing, but it involved a dinosaur and was hilarious. And the last thing that I want to talk about with Shoot 'em Up, and I think is one of the biggest points of cheeky contention in the film, mm-hmm. is that toward the end you realize that Smith is doing this whole thing because he thinks that there aren't enough gun laws. Right. And he's doing this all to prove a point that guns are bad and guns are dangerous and people are jerks 
and that maybe if he does this, there will be stricter laws on who can own a gun. Right. Which, I mean, it doesn't make any goddamn sense. Yeah, the movie just says, surprise, this is about gun laws. Yeah. It's, I mean, I <laughs> think it's... You wait a second. <laughs> it's a total joke. Right. And it's just a play on the fact that the film's been cheeky all along. But, I, I mean, I love the film. I love the fact that Paul Giamatti gets shot by Clive Owen's hand at the end of the film. Oh, and all the myth-busting. Yes. Goes, there is a Mythbusters episode. There's at least one Mythbusters episode. I know at this episode. point we should be paid by Mythbusters to plug their show this often, but uh, they do have a million seasons. They do. So they cover pretty much everything. And there's a great shoot 'em up episode. I feel, and, and I'm just going to throw this out there, and let me know what you think. I feel like in a movie, you know, shoot 'em up, it has this kind of controversial viral campaign. It's about, you know, a baby being shot at. They're thinking people might be up in arms. Excuse sure. the accidental pun on that. My thought here is at the end, we throw in all this stuff about gun laws. It's not pointed and it's not sharp satire. It's more like uh, a pacifier. Excuse the pun. No, I don't think it's to appease people at all. I think it's um, to mock them. Yeah, I think it's more, you know, when we talk about a phrase like pushing people's buttons. Sure. You know, like a John Waters film. Sure. You know, well, something, that, something that Crank does with its obscene editing. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I think instead, this, this movie kind of has a control panel of all possible buttons to push. Uh-huh. And it might just be jamming its fists everywhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It might just be playing whack-a-mole on this control panel and uh, seeing if it can offend anybody. Yeah. Uh, people show up and they they saw a shoot them up and they love guns and the whole movie celebrating guns. And at the end, they just... They're kind of just like, and that's why you have to practice gun safety. And it's just to piss people off. It's to just piss a tiny off the bit. people who are rooting for it the whole time. Right. The one group <laughs> right. of people that thought they had found their champion film. Right, right. Just to prevent the NRA from picking up the film and showing it at its fucking meetings. Well, we already gave you the uh, email address. That's doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Certainly. GIF of Paul Giamatti killing a baby. Oh, please. Um, we also have a website, which is doublefeatureshow.com. Yeah, so this website, since the new version went up, there's a ton of new stuff on here. Uh, one of the things that's kind of cool, on each of the episode pages, instead of just getting a, a random paragraph of sentences that sort of explain what we're going over, and then a bunch of movies we reference, we're trying to make the website useful for people outside of uh, no one, I believe, was uh, previously the user right. base. Uh, people who can't subscribe through iTunes. They were the only people who went. I keep adding things to this website in hopes that people will go to it. So here's my goal. I'm curious at this point, have you ever used it as a reference for anything? Uh, not since recently. So put a bunch of stuff up on there. Uh, my goal is uh, perhaps by the end of the year, you will have said, oh, I really need this. Okay. And gone to our website. All right. Right. So we talked about the artwork. That's up there. Um, you can learn about the directors and stuff. That's up there. Uh, the other thing I put in uh, that's pretty cool is that... In each of these show pages, aside from information about the show, you can find detailed information about the movies themselves. So when we have movies that accidentally, you know, have the same writer or uh, have some of the same cast members or come out in the same year, you can find information on there like that information, the director, the year, a kind of short synopsis of the movie. Um, the, the part about writers has been really fantastic just in looking up the writer to each film. Right. We have done all sorts of movies by the same writers that I had no idea huh. were written by the same people. So you can now go on the episode page for, say, Crank and shoot him up and learn who, kind of get a, a mini IMDb profile without having to go over to IMDb mm -hmm. and navigate through their, their constant changes. Doublefeatureshow.com. Fantastic website, if I could just pat myself on the back. Absolutely. Doublefeaturesshow.com. All right, so uh, we got two more next time. Next time we're doing some uh, some pairing of directors that are weirdos. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a director weirdo double feature. So what are the two weird movies by the weird directors? We're going to do um, Weirdo Argento's Deep Red and Weirdo Gordon Lewis's The Gorgo -Gor Girls. Last year, we accidentally discovered this uh, this amazing thing, which was petting the white cat. Uh-huh. And so the concept there was we saw Enter the Dragon, and I was afraid to cover Enter the Dragon because I thought I wouldn't understand it. I thought it was too artsy. I had never seen it, and I was just I, I just thought conceptually it would be way too high up there. And in it, there's a villain who literally pets a white cat. The movie's kind of silly. A great movie. Sure. Don't get me wrong. Sure, but it's but not a heady, scary it's, foreign It's not film. as hard as I expected right. it would be to cover. 
Um, so what we want to do is cover Dario Argento and Herschel Gordon Lewis in this episode because they are directors who are pet the white cat directors. Sure. They're directors who I like and I enjoy their movies, but maybe being a master of horror doesn't necessarily mean you are incredibly hard to digest. It and, pretty and much just means you put a guy through the windshield of a car. Not too hard. And as long as you're great at your craft, we can put your movies on the show. So we're going to talk about some movies that you can actually totally understand from two directors you may have been afraid of. Awesome. Watch more fucking film. Bye.